few words. I had the opportunity to start my career in the software development and um, kind of a technical career very early. So essentially, I'm earning money from software development since 91, 1991. And uh, through this time, I had the opportunity to work in the um, consultancies, a product company, academia, uh, as a freelancer, a lot of freelancing, military as a freelancer also. Last 12 years, I'm working in Futurize, and uh, through the experience in Futurize, we had the opportunity to work with so many clients and so many projects that I think that maybe a little bit we can observe some common trends or at least anecdotal evidences or stories how we perceive the projects, how we perceive teams, how you perceive yourself in the project, or how do you talk to your clients. And uh, I try to gather these thoughts in, uh, in this presentation, and because it's mostly a dialogue, I love stock images, so I've used a lot of stock images, and I think I used every single PowerPoint transition to prevent you to falling asleep if you cannot concentrate on what I'm talking, but let's see how it will turn out. Uh, today I'm um, heading the software development in Futurize, and uh, because majority of us engineers, and uh, as Bruno said, we have to sell pretty much all the time. We have to sell ourselves, we have to sell teams, we have to sell ideas, and uh, we have to sell the clients' ideas to their organizations. And uh, so here it is. But first, if nothing else, but I would like you to remember three, only three things after this presentation. And those three things are very common. You've heard them before, but because we're human beings, we are forgetting what we are learning. So a lot of things that I'm going to talk about, I sure you've heard before many many times you might i don't know you might uh, correlate with them they might you might disagree with them but at least we would have time to discuss them um, after the presentation the thing number one is very obvious there is no silver bullet i really would like to stress that the second thing i would like you to remember is that Please talk to each other all the time in the project settings, in the client settings. And the thing, number three, I would like you to remember is use basic math. If nothing else, you will remember, but only these three things from the presentation, I think that I accomplished my mission, what I set up to do today. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about Silver Bullet. Then we are going to talk more about communication and why you have to talk to each other. And we are going to talk a little about the usage, usage of basic math. Okay, <clears throat> so first of all is um, June, or no, it was April 1987. Very special date because at this date there was published Computer Magazine with the super, super famous article by Fred Brooks, No Silver Bullet. Who read this article before? Or who is aware, at least? Yeah. Yeah. Fred Brooks is also a very famous person because he wrote another famous book, which is called Mythical Man Months. And uh, the uh, No Silver Bullet the actual title is The Essence and Accidents of Software Engineering. And this is very important. What is essence and uh, what is an accident of software engineering? And the essence, it's pretty much what you cannot get rid of. And the accidents, they will be solved during the time, progress, etc., etc. And the main point of the article is that software engineering and software development is incredibly complex. And this is actually not an accident, it's an essence. 
it was more complex before because we used primitive computers, we used primitive machines, we used um, uh, low-level languages, and as we progress, we can remove some of those accidental difficulties. But the essence of complexity remains the same. The software is complex. And when we are talking about account management, when we are talking about project management, essentially, of course, in, in our domain, we are talking about digital products, we are talking about software. I think a lot of these things can be applied to other industries, but the software is pretty much the essence of what we do. And uh, why the software is complex? Because it's a mental abstract, it doesn't exist. It exists in our heads. And then we translate it into the set of commands. And we can do exactly the same thing in many, many different ways. And that's the essence of software complexity. And there are um, people who are saying that, for example, we can compare it to aviation industry. And the very in I, I've read some uh, blog, uh, was it from one of the um, um, original authors of the uh, Agile Manifesto, I think it is, where the the peak of aviation industry happened in the 60s when the Boeing 747 was produced, because f essentially nothing has changed since then. It was a sharp, if you look from the beginning of the century, all those like biplans and like all those primitive machines, the ultimate DC-3, but Boeing 474 is the ultimate machine, flying machine, and if you look at our client experience or customer experience, how we are flying, it's pretty much stuck in the 60s with the Boeing 747. Was there any progress after that? Of course, but this progress was not in the essence. This progress was in accidents. Avionics, new materials, new customer experience, but the actual thing is the same. Exactly the same, I think, applies to the software development, that we've removed quite a lot of accidents why the software development is complex, but the actual thing is remaining the same. Plus, when I'm talking about mental abstracts, that exactly the same thing can be achieved with multiple ways. Let's do a very little experiment right now. How many of you have any kind of software development background related to the web, for example? or have any ideas what is web development, like we have some backends, we have some frontends. Now, I will ask you one question, and please remember the very first thing or potential implementation idea that will come to your mind. So I'm your client, and I will ask you, can you please create for me a landing page for my service that will take some like contact form, with the contact form? Landing page with the contact form, right? Now, how many of you were thinking about the bunch of static HTML files with the CSS? How many of you were thinking about JavaScript single page application? How many of you were thinking about um, some ready-made service like Vix or WordPress or something like that? doesn't matter. So, it's exactly the same thing, and there are so many different ways of how to achieve exactly the same thing, and all of those, there's no wrong answer, because how you're going to choose depends on your current client setting and what are the expectations, what do you need. So, that, that's like thing number one. And the idea is that simple problems require pretty much simple and primitive solutions and complex problems require very complex solutions because this is essentially exactly the same thing. This is a um, nuclear accelerator in, in CERN and all of these things are basically hitting one thing with another. Like really. So nail with the hammer or one atom with, with like a bunch of other particles. but the implementation and the settings are completely different. And uh, one thing that uh, we are noticing when we are talking with the um, a 
product owners or engineering teams is that product owners have a tendency to oversimplify the problem. It cannot be that complex. Engineering teams have a tendency to overcomplicate the problem. And we are talking about exactly the same thing, how to marry these two mental abstracts together, something that is uh, at the same time can't be that hard, but at the same time requires so much effort. That's about silver bullet. A topic number two, which is naturally coming from the last slide, because when you have two abstracts and you have to somehow marry them together, you have to talk to each other. And that's another like a really, really big part. How do we talk to each other in a project setting? How do we talk to each other with uh, when we are implementation team or when we are client? And uh, it really depends. And there are so many settings. How do we talk and why we are, we are talking to each other? And uh, one obvious thing is pretty much, I told you a lot of stock images, abstractions, oh sorry, assumptions and the facts. Everybody understand that assumption is very dangerous. And the only way to find some kind, some kind of a solution is with the actual facts. But the problem is that even when you are starting to state the facts to your audience or to the project team or to your product owner, you are realizing that those facts are based on their assumptions, based on their backgrounds, and essentially they might, you are thinking you are saying one thing, but it's perceived in a completely different way. And uh, uh, I've been observing that uh, there are few roles that can give you a clue of how do we talk to each other. There are lots of roles in the typical digital project settings, but I would like to talk about three roles today. The first role is um, a product owner. It doesn't really matter if you're a consultancy or if you're, it's an internal product owner, if it's your external client or internal client, because in the modern organizations, they are so big that you really have to consider them as your clients and or your buyers. Then I would like to talk about the a junior specialist. In my setup, it's um, pretty much a, a junior developer, a senior specialist. So these three cornerstones are perceiving information and uh, they are like based on completely different assumptions. And today I would like to talk a little bit about them. And then you as a account manager or a project manager might be able to use this and uh, set up a better project or a better team. And uh, if we talk about um, a traditional a product owner, there are two sides of the story always. And uh, I would like to give you a couple of real quotes from the real product owners that we've been talking to. It can't be that complex. So when we are setting up a project or when we are discussing the budget and time and technology, it can't be that complex. So this is a very typical. The thing number two, why the team is so weak and understand that correctly. They are stopping their work day at four o'clock in the evening and go home while I am like burning the midnight oil and I'm working here all the time. And this like disproportional perception of the what I'm doing as the important product owner who is trying to launch the product or keep it going and the team, whether it's consulting team or internal team, these are completely different universes. And uh, uh, another thing that you hear is uh, it's a crunch time, so it's a deadline. Let's see what you are capable of. Because, hey, it's fun. Now it's time to push everything. And the only way that you can start to interact and counterpart that is trying to understand that the team 
actually doesn't have at all the same goals, the same benefits as you do. They are not most pro they are working for a salary. They are not getting this, this, and that benefit. And the whole setup of you as a product owner is really completely different as a team. And uh, the uh, reality of a modern teams is that I'm just uh, trying to get the work done and go home and be with my family. And the product owner might have a completely different set of goals. I really would like to launch this product and I would like you to do everything. On the flip side, if we start to trying to decipher that, yes, Matthew, I'm using every single transition in, in, in the PowerPoint, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Think about like a product in production. Like every, um, in every setup, probably you have a product owner who is not really um, responsible for the actual technology. If you're a product owner, you would like to, I don't know, launch a digital newspaper, you would like to start the production, and it's like you are buying when you are buying a car. Do you really interested in how it was built? Are you really interested how it was built? And there are like tons of examples like that. The thing number two is that very often what you are doing with the client or with your product owner, you are trying to help your product owner to win inside the organization. And if you are helping inside the organization, that's actually a huge win for the product owner. And essentially, you are creating a comfort. And what we observed across many, many projects is the comfort is, is like a viral infection, a very good one in a positive sense. It is very, very difficult to switch from the very good project team to another project team from one contractor to another if you have a specific level of, of comfort. And that's one of the most important things in how you're actually building a project, a client, account, etc. Now let's switch to the second role. And uh, it's a junior specialist. And we have to work a lot with the junior specialist. All of us were at some point in our life junior specialists. And uh, this role dictates completely different um, rules of how do you communicate. And uh, more often than not, your junior specialist does have very specific technology attachment. Please remember yourself when you were in your 20s, when you are um, very excited about specific uh, technology or a specific skill, this is the best thing ever since the sandwich invention. And this thing will change the world, and you truly, truly believe into that. So this type of a technology attachment is very common. The second thing is that um, if you talk with the junior specialist, every decision for the junior specialist, how it's perceived, it's the most important decision of their life at this specific point. And that's true. That's how the reality is perceived. So. Do I choose this or that? How do I talk to this or that person? Do I participate in this project or not? These are the most important decisions of my life right now. And because, of course, I would like to prove myself. And I would like to do it alone. I would like to do it on my own. And I will probably not ever ask help because I really, really would like to show myself. And on the flip side, what we have is you really have to establish the mentorship. The good mentor will help a lot in the team. And I'm not talking about team leader. I'm not talking about project manager. I'm talking about like a real mentor. If you can establish the mentorship institution in your team, where there will be always somebody experienced, where your junior specialist can comfortably talk to. Then rules of the game. This is another very interesting um, uh, part. A lot of times we see that junior specialists are trying to, um, how would I say, they're trying to jump out of the box. 
in a good way. And that can ruin your account. Let me give you an example. For example, um, if you have a junior specialist who is having a difficulties in their organization trying to solve specific problem, looking at some old code, and the next thing a junior specialist is doing is like a sending email to European chief of operations of this company saying, hey, your stuff is bad. Like, true story, it happens. So, establishing the rules of the game where, I mean, it's not asking all the time, but that's where, like, mentorship is helping. And encourage, ask everything and ask all the time. We used to have a, um, a mantra in Futurize, and still is, ask why. And this is very important that your junior specialist will be always comfortable asking any kind of questions within the team, organization, or a client. Another special topic for the junior specialist is professional burnout. Because the junior specialists, they do have incredible energy. This is something most of us over a certain period of certain age are lacking naturally. It's a natural process. That's the beauty of being young. You have incredible amount of energy, and it's great that we can use that. However, it comes with the very, very big danger that junior specialist is very, very likely to burn out if you will not establish rule of the game, that you have to take care of yourself because you will not notice. And one of the um, analogies that I'm using all the time and I'm repeating for many years that professional burnout, it's not a slope. It's actually a cliff. You don't know that you are burning out until you're actually falling off the cliff. And it's important to have a mentor who will stop you and recognize you that you are overdoing this. And now let's talk about senior specialists. The common threats that we can see in senior specialists is, do you remember that when I said the first thing in the junior specialist, like a technology attachment? So exactly the same threat, but from the other direction. I've been using this thing many years and it works. I'm going to use this again. But at the same time, there is another threat and it's um, learning opportunities. Uh, if you've been using something over and over again, you really would like to try something else. And that's an interesting paradox. Actually, when something is becoming boring for you as a specialist, it means that you have achieved the highest possible level, and that's where you are the most productive. And how to make sure that your senior specialists are, even that they're bored with the specific technology because they've been doing it for so long, but how to extend this time and at the same time do not overburn them. It's an art. I don't know how to do this every time. It's like very individual, but this is very special. Who is driving a car? Remember how you were driving your car like the very first few times in your life or when you were learning how to ride a bike? or skating. You were concentrating. Now when you're like driving a car or riding a bike, you are not even thinking about that, how you're doing that. Your thoughts are somewhere else and you're just like driving. That's exactly where you are becoming a professional. And it's very interesting to observe how people who are professional actually jumping to the new things, it's a good, but at the same time, at this specific moment, they're losing that specific skill. And uh, on the flip side, the professional intuition that you cannot replace at all. What does it mean? It means that you don't know why certain things are. You just know them because your whole experience is coming from there. And organizational wisdom. If you have a senior specialist, most probably the specialist will not be sending that email to the European chief of operations of your client that, hey, your stuff is bad. We have to replace everything. And what is your role as the um, um, account manager or a project manager? And there are few short ideas or things that I would like to mention today. Are you actually a leader? Or are you a protector? Are those the same things? 
And that's where it gets interesting because essentially your task is, remember the comfort for the client, it's exactly the same. Your task is to create environment so that the team will be really comfortable. And uh, you are also a connector. Sometimes when you would like people to talk and you see that your team are sitting next to each other and instead of talking to each other, they're actually using some, I don't know, some Slack or something to talking to the person who sits like next. And this is something that sometimes you have to do. And sometimes it's enough just to connect people so that they will start talking to each other. And the, another important thing is, of course, the expectations. And uh, this is so difficult. How to manage the expectations of what is being produced. Because uh, very often you might hear even if you're communicating correctly with the client or with your product owner that, yeah, we've been working on this for six months and we achieved everything we want, but I expected more. And why is that? And this is like very, very uh, uh, difficult question because there is another side of that. For example, we've been working on this for the six months but our client didn't exactly understand what we were building. And that's pretty much not your team's failure, that's like your failure. And uh, another common mistake that I hear is and, and see like a proper communication. What is actually a minimum viable product? And what's the difference between the prototype? And these things are very different and they are mixed together all the time because the minimum viable product is something that you can actually start and launch and people are using it. Probably not everything we wanted, but it's the actual final thing. And when we are building a prototype, well, it's a prototype. It's like paper and, and glue and some other things. And uh, like time and time and time again, when we are prototyping something and delivering it to the, to the um, client and to our product owner, what we see is like, well, you've done that. Awesome, let's put it in production. No, we can't. And the art of communicating the difference between the prototype and the minimum viable product is, is uh, an art that you will pick up across the years. The next thing is how to talk about if your client, your product owner, if you want to have something now. I want to have something right now. I have money, I would like to have it now. The best communication strategy, actually, is to talk about metaphors. And I believe our next speaker is going to talk a lot about metaphors in uh, presenting ideas. Uh, the metaphor is actually very simple. What do you do in real life if you would like to get something right now? And you don't have possibilities to do that, but you want something right now. For example, you want to have an apartment, but you don't really have that half a million. What do you do? You take a loan in the bank. Totally normal. However, not only you will have to pay for that for years to come, it has the maintenance cost. If everything goes well, if something goes wrong, <clears throat> you probably will have to even refinance it. It's exactly the same in the project. If you would like to have something right now, I want to launch my product now, you will accumulate a lot of technical debt. And how to explain that? That's another task that account manager or a project manager will have to do. I'll give you a couple of examples, another example about um, um, uh, technological debt. Who knows what is that? Ford Bayard, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Why the Ford Bayard is actually used quite a lot in the presentations about technical debt? Because of the story. It was built and uh, in 18, I don't remember something, so it was built across 60 years. And the original idea was because the um, cannons, they do have a specific firing range, and in order to cover the whole coast, they would like to have another point, another gun for it. And there was like a crazy engineering project to create artificial island to put a gun for there. 
They overcome the technical challenges. They built it. It took 60 years. But guess what? During those 60 years, the technology moved so far that the range of the cannons became so great that there was absolutely no need to build that. And it was abandoned for almost 80 years until the wonderful and fantastic show picked it up for the television. And um, <clears throat> another metaphor that you can use, um, how to like, mix together the project management and the goals of the project and expectations, is um, actually very simple. And now uh, I would like you to remember um, uh, the scientific experiment on the moon. It's a, it's a very bad quality, but do you remember when the hammer and the feather were dropped at the same time? And uh, on Earth, we have a gravity. On Moon, we have a gravity. On Earth, we have air, so we have an air pressure, so the, the feather cannot actually go with the same speed. On Moon, we don't have any resistance. So the project that we are going, or test that we are going to do, is uh, pretty much kind of in the same domain. <clears throat> so let's assume that this is our project goals, right? And this is our project, and that's what like size what we would like to do. And uh, my project goal is like, so these are my uh, requirements. I would like to hit it. So I, I'm pretty sure that I can hit it right, like this, like, right? So we are somewhere there, right? What happens next? Now we don't have this type of a like, physical body. We have something else. We have like a balloon which is flimsy and like air can like react and I think I'm pretty sure I can like hit it right now also. And so this is very very tiny project requirements and like the content of the project but now if we have actually a big project now we have a force of na different forces of nature and organization to react with the balloon very primitive example can I actually hit it here so, yes, almost. But now we have a very complex organization. Bruno, I would like to have your help. Yeah. So you are one of the product owners. I need another volunteer. Yeah. So what you'll have to do, you'll have to do some, something like this so that there would be some airflow, like closer to the... And now let's see. So this is actually real life. Like you can start doing that. Can we actually hit this? Your ball is in your side. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we are managing the project. So if you would like to actually manage the process, how it will go, you can have project management tools. And this... No, guys, you're not done. Not done. Yeah, no. <laughs> So, this is, these are my project management tools. So, I can create an environment where my project, if it's big and complex, and we have a gravity, and we have air resistance. So, and now when you start doing your organizational things, it will go pretty much in. But then, what happens if you start squeezing too tight? It will not go, or if you squeeze it even tighter, it will not go in. So this is a project. This is a project management. These are product owners. This is organization. And how to make all of this work is to create like perfect balance where it's not too tight, it's not like too rejecting all the requirements from organization, and that's one of those metaphors that you can use for the project management. Thank you, friends. Yeah, and another thing is that in organization, when you're trying to navigate all of this, so this is the actual infrastructure that you most probably will work with. And of course, I mean, we've spent millions on it. It can be really bad. It was 20 years ago, but still, we invested a lot. And the common thing that you hear from the modern organization is that you are updating one obsolete version of a software or a database to another obsolete version of the database, because we do have a budget for that. 
And what we really actually want, of course, when we are working with such project, we would like to build something like this. And that's where organization is becoming a problem. And how to navigate organization, that's the challenge. <clears throat> Do you know what's the most difficult thing uh, with the like, really, really difficult organizations? Is when the people are actually incredibly nice. It would be actually much better and if the product owners and organization would be actually evil. But when you have nice, talented people and they are trying to achieve the common goal, but the organizational structure prevents them from doing that, that's very hard. And uh, essentially, when you are trying to solve that, you have to explain over and over again that the um, oh, sorry that it's the software is not a product software is a process and the big part of this process is a long-term planning how you are going to survive how you are going to my favorite word maintain this whole infrastructure this whole project and the actual real-life example is that, do you know that since the beginning of the any metro system in any big city, which is by now it's over 100 years, there was not even a single day when it was not maintained. So, and that's pretty much exactly the same about like big, large software projects where you have to maintain that all the time. And today, you have to make sure that it's a future-proof maintenance. What does it mean? Today, organizations are having a huge challenge. Any developer, a good developer, technical specialist, they have today absolutely no problems finding any job they want. It means that technical talent can actually choose where they would like to work. And if organization is building on obsolete stack or something which is not interesting, in the long run, they will not be able to actually find their own or consultancy people to do that. And to build everything with the future-proof maintenance, this is another challenge. And if we return back to our uh, project management experiment, that we are trying to set up a framework how to work with the project management, then what we are using? We are using um, a tools, and these tools can be an agile development, it can be waterfall. We can use any kind of techniques, but in the reality, of course, it will look more like this. However, all of these are actual rituals. And in reality, we are humans, we are not some constructs, and all the project management methodologies are a construct of a mind. And the very common situation that you can face in an organization that, hey, we are becoming fully agile now, and this is our sprint planning for the next 18 months. It's actually a true phrase from a client that I will not name. It means that we are building rituals, we are building some form of a cargo cult, but the actual substance is that what we are trying to fit us as specialists who are humans into a cyborgs. And lots of companies are trying to do that right now, but we cannot be cyborgs because we are humans and we have to think about team dynamics, we have to think about like mental fatigue, which is another interesting topic, is that the mental fatigue in the long-running projects, even if you have the best ever project, sooner or later your team can get bored. And the finding this moment and identifying this and how to switch the people around, so this is something that a good account manager and project manager will do. And a few other things. Um, a question to you. Have you ever noticed that your colleagues that you know really well suddenly, in your opinion, are starting to, doing, starting to do um, unusual and not wise things? Did you ever see this kind of, like, you know a person, you know a specialist, and suddenly, 
according to you, a person is not doing what a person is supposed to do. Why is that? A long time ago, we identified, at least in future eyes, how we tried to like, solve this problem, because actually there is not enough information of making a wise decision to consider all possible options. And that's why one of the super, super critical parts in setting up a project and a team is to have a full, absolute team transparency. And it means that the team has to have access to absolutely everything. The finances, the how much my hour costs, what the project is getting out of that. Uh, because eventually, if you have a team, and this team understands that everything they do has a consequences, a positive or a negative. That's where you can actually start building the um, like pretty unique things. Okay, and a very short conclusion. Uh, if you remember the third thing that I mentioned, so the first one, the no silver bullet, talk to each other, lots of talking, and use basic math. Um, I have a, a, one of my favorite movies, uh, Apollo 13, and one moment struck me in the movie many, many years ago. And this moment where the, um, uh, Jack Swagger, which was played by Kevin Bacon, was uh, talking with the Bill Paxton, uh, which was playing astronaut Frank Hayes. And uh, when uh, Kevin Bacon was trying to um, convinced the, um, his colleague that the, the people at Earth, they actually they don't have re-entry procedures for us. And there's like a huge heated argument in the end, Bill Paxton asking, how do you know? And the uh, Jack Swaggart is answering, I can add. This phrase kind of was in my, my head for a really, really long time. And that's how you can actually check up on a lot of things. You can calculate pretty much everything in any project setting. And you can use the basic math instead of what we call a hope-based management. We hope that everything will go well. And the, uh, if you, like really, the tools are there. You don't really have like deep analytical mind or anything. You really can see the like performance of the people, you can see the, uh, like you can have the references from your previous projects, you simply like have the uh, physical laws of the universe. And uh, the interesting fact is that the most denial you will get actually from the management layer who are driven by the numbers. So this is a paradox that we've been encountering many, many times, but that's, this is a fact. So when you are actually able to calculate and when you can actually see that, for example, this project doesn't make sense for us financially at all, how do we combine how much effort we're mixing in like a sales and the actual uh, project? So this is the point of very interesting discussion with the, um, with the team. And uh, sometimes you can even calculate that here is a moment of trifecta or kind of a negative trifecta. In every project, you can see the moment where two factors are kind of a negative. It's still okay. But when there are three, then when everything is starting to collapse, it might be a new client, new team, new technology, or no experience in this, or for example, absolutely no communication with integration partner and the client is on vacation. So in this combination of trifactors are something that can be calculated way in advance and it will avoid all possible hell in the project. Okay, concluding. So, I was asking you to remember three things. There is really no silver bullet, there is no magic. And uh, by talking to each other, you can essentially achieve what you're trying to achieve. is like a good account management and good project management. And the best tool ever that you can have at the disposal is actually basic math. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>